33. Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. In order to keep the show going through 2024 and beyond, we need a hundred Patreon subscribers. We are only 33 Patreon subscribers away from hitting this first major milestone on Patreon. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Senkos or a jackhammer chatterbait, you'll receive a special monthly discount off all of your orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, whether in-store or online. You'll be entered in weekly prize giveaways only for our Patreon members. You'll have access to members-only content and access to a private Facebook group community. And on top of that, you'll have the satisfaction of knowing that you're the reason this show continues. If you feel like you could donate, I would really appreciate it. Link in the episode description down below. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Monday Night Live. We are finally out of the holiday season as we're kind of getting back into our daily routine. I think we went seven months straight on doing a Monday Night Live before Christmas and Thanksgiving kind of broke up the monotony there. A couple of housekeeping things, as always, before we get into our show today. We have the Richmond Fishing Expo. As always, Fishing the DMV is going to be at the Richmond Fishing Expo. We are booth uh, 103. We're booth 103. We are leaving, I think it's on Wednesday or Thursday morning to get on down there. Wednesday, for sure, I'm going to drop the live schedule. I think we're going to do Friday. We're going to go booth to booth, doing a live stream to each booth, show you what's down there. Saturday, I'm going to be available just for conversation. We're going to do a couple of interviews. And then Sunday, I'm just going to bring as many interviews on as possible. This could change between now and Wednesday when I drop the schedule, but that just kind of keep you guys in just in the know. Um, our Patreon supporter of the week is Matthew Lasky. Matthew, you just want a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. Please, please feel free to reach out to me so I can make sure you get your, your prize. Uh, as always tonight, this is how these, these live streams work. Ask a good question. You win a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. Um, without further ado, uh, I brought this guy came on the show way back a thousand years ago in September to talk about uh, the lake that pretty much every tournament organization decides to go to for regionals every single year, Kerr or Bugs Island. I guess it's Carr, Kerr, depending on where you are and what your native dialect is. So without further ado, we're going to bring on the man, the myth, the legend, Will Nash. Will, thank you so much for being here, sir. Hey, bud. How you doing? Thanks I'm for doing, having me. Uh, dude, you know, thank you for coming back. I really appreciate it. Um, last episode, we hinted at the striper fishing. And today, the two big topics I wanted to really cover is, of course, guys, we're going to get to wintertime bass fishing at, at Bugs Island. But first, we've never done a true striper show or talked about striper fishing at all, which is a disservice because I try to do a little bit of everything here. So first and foremost, how did you catch the striper bug? Uh, bass fishing. I was out there bass fishing, watching birds, seeing them dive, go over there and catch a few of them. Um, and then just started figuring out kind of what their migration patterns were, started studying a little bit more. And I mean, I love bass fishing, but striper fishing is my mistress. I mean, from again, as soon as they get going good, beginning of November, it's pretty much all I do till February. I will mix in some bass fishing. I had the, uh, the last two weeks of the year off from work. I did get a couple of good bass trips in, but it's primarily just striper fishing. I love the way they fight. Um, I love watching the birds, trying to keep up with them. And it's just, uh, it's a good time, man. Dude. I mean, it's like one of the only few fit, like the few fish in, um, fresh water that really will test all of your tackle, you know, and we talk yeah. about large mouth and small mouth and what they can do, but it, when you get a 20, 30 pound striper, that thing will lock your gears. It really will. Yeah. Yeah. And I've never caught a 20 or 30 pound striper at, uh, at Bugs Island or anywhere for that matter. Um, I need to spend more time at Smith Mountain Lake, but I have so much fun. I know what they're doing. And um, for me, catching, going out and catching 30 to 50, you know, seven to 12 pound stripers is just as fun as catching five or six, you know, bigger stripers. But um, yeah, they, they, they are a good, 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 good time. If you've never been striper fishing on Curve, man, you got to get out there in November and December and get after it. It's starting to get a little bit tougher. I was out there today fishing. Uh, and before the snow and the sleet and ice and everything came in. But uh, this time of year, the, the big schools kind of break up uh, in that November, December, they do that false run. Um, so this year they went, I guess, the two weeks leading up to Thanksgiving, they ran all the way up to Buffalo and Bluestone and the whole main lake stretched there. There were just giant schools of anywhere from 50 to 200 just roaming out there. The birds 
would give them away a lot. Uh, and then they slowly started working their way back down the lake all the way up until probably the week after Christmas, the week of Christmas, we Damn. were still catching them in Clarksville. Yeah. What would you, and we're going to circle back to Kerr, but what would you consider the the top lakes for striper fishing in the area, the, the North Carolina, Virginia area? Uh, probably Smith Mountain, I would say. I'm sure there's some others. There's one I've heard of in North Carolina, and I can't recall the name of it. Um, I've heard some some Smith Mountain Lake striper fishermen reference it. Um, I, again, I can't recall it, but I would say Smith Mountain probably. And I've got some friends that have been going out to the bay and catching you know, 40 and 50 pound stripers the last two weeks. Um, but yeah, as far as actual, uh, lakes around here, I would say Smith mountain probably. So Smith, um, Kerr, and then like a Lake Anna or something like that. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. You know, I've never striper fished Lake Anna, so I'm not sure how big, maybe, you know, maybe you know that, um, what is a big striper in, in Lake Anna? I, I think about 10 to 15 pounds. And I guess someone okay. in the comment section can kill me there, but like you've mentioned Smith and a couple people have mentioned Smith, but is it really that good? Cause I've maybe it's cause I'm just such a bass head. I never thought about striper fishing and I'm not in those circles, but Smith's got good striper fishing. Yes. I mean, they, the citations come out of there. I think Gaston's got some good stripers, especially up there, um, up there towards the dam. I think you can get, get that 35 to 38 inch striper, uh, in Gaston. Uh, but yeah, Smith mountain. I mean, from what I've been told and people I've talked to, yeah, you can get those, there's 15, 20 plus pound stripers coming out of there. Absolutely. That's freaking awesome. I mean, I mean, so I'm excited. Let's, let's kind of get into it a little bit more. Do, do striper behave like largemouth? Was it a really hard thing for you to like adjust when you started to try to target them directly? It, it was what I tell everybody with stripers. It, it's following them and learning from them over the last five years has taught me to think about the lake differently. So how a bass may think about a, you know, let's say you're going into Rudge Creek and you've got one of the two main creeks on the right. Um, people from Curl know what I'm talking about. And you think about breaking that down, a striper would treat that entire arm of Rudge Creek like a bass would treat that very small creek arm. Okay. Um, so it, for me, it, and they move so much, they're constantly moving, they're constantly swimming. Uh, if you see a striper sitting still, uh, you know, on live scope, that's not a striper that's going to be easy to catch. If they're moving and hunting and searching and looking, you want those active fish. But how much how much area they can cover in just a few hours is, is phenomenal. Um, so for me, yeah, it, it did. And what they relate to sometimes in the summertime, you'll catch stripers off brush piles. It's got bass in it. Um, but this time of year when I really target them, they, they're moving, they're hunting, they're looking. Uh, they're feeding on big bait balls, things of that nature. Um, so they, they really do approach bass. And I, I did catch some bass today when I was out there striper fishing. Oh, cool. Uh, on those big bait balls, you'd see a little pot of three or four, and they weren't anything big, you know, two to three pound, uh, two to three pound bass out there. But they were out there deep. You really won't see a, a lot of small bass out there deep with those stripers. They're usually the, I think, two plus, three plus pound largemouth. But yeah, you do have to adjust your tactics and think about it differently. How do the largemouth and the striper, do they co-mingle? Are they definitely on live scope? Are they two distinct different pods? Like how does that dynamic work yeah. under the water? Yeah, they're two distinctive pods. You can tell, I mean, you can tell um, by the size, the return, the the, the fuzziness of the return. Uh, largemouth generally look different than stripers. There's times where you get them mixed up, but predominantly the way they also, a lot of times the way they school up to will be a little bit different. Um and again, it, there's exceptions to everything. What I mean, a lot of times, large amount to be in a long straight line, where stripers will kind of be, they'll kind of be in a straight line, but there's a leader in the pack where large mouth are kind of roaming more a little bit, in my mm. experience. Um, but it's usually just the size of the return and the fuzziness of the return. But I mean, that, that like I said, I was was out there, you know, catching stripers, and you look at me, see a pot of large mouth. It's, it's not as many. And uh, again, the ones you're going to see are going to be like three to five in a pot. And they're going to be that two plus pound large mouth. So with that said, like generally speaking in the winter time right now, you're going out there. What are you looking for? Um, and then what's your, what's your tackle? Is it as complicated as we make large mouth and small mouth? No, I mean, it's, I love striper fishing because I'm usually keeping, you know, two to four rods on my deck at any given time. And what I normally start doing is uh, it's just birds. I like watching birds. That's, that's really, I mean, there's no secret to it. Anybody that's been down there striper fishing knows the birds will start to tell, you know, to give things away. But 
even when it gets tough like this, you're not always going to go out there and see a bunch of seagulls diving and, you know, running up under the birds and catching fish. I just want to get in a section of the lake. There's a big concentration of those birds. Uh, and the real giveaway is uh, loons. Really? If I can find a big pot of loons, I promise you within 500 yards, there's striper around those loons every time. And the, the bigger congregation of loons, like three or more in a little pot, work in the same bank or the same point, there's stripers in those areas. I mean, there was, there was one day back uh, the week after Thanksgiving, it was a kind of an overcast and rainy day in Clarksville. Uh, and all I was doing was riding around looking for paws of loons. And I'd pull up and I'd go out there and kind of scan around with the live scope. I'd do some side scanning and try to side scan 140 foot out on both sides, trying to find those big schools of stripers and I'll turn around on them. But the loons really, really give it away. Uh, especially when the seagulls and the the gulls slow down. Do you not? So I'm, I'm trying to think your process. So is it more like step one is look for the birds and the loons before you make a cast. And then step two, you drop the scope on them and then you make a decision whether you stay or leave. Correct. Correct. Yep. Uh, uh, okay. If I, if I'm riding down the lake and I see a bunch of loons, I'll probably go down through there and side scan and, I wish I had some better pictures. There were some guys messaging me on Facebook asking what the side. I just, as soon as I start to see myself get into that school or run to the front, drop the trolling motor, turn around on them, and then I'm trying to make a cast on them. And then that's why you want to use heavier lines so you can kind of horse those fish in and stay up with the school because sometimes you can have your trolling motor on high and you can't keep up with that school of stripers to save your life, especially really? if there's wind. Yeah, they're that. I mean, they're they're moving, man. But Jesus. Yeah, you want to try to get that school going away from you if you can and make a cast on them that way. But coming to you works as well. Um, but it just feels like it's presented more natural if they're moving away from you. Again, so it's I don't almost, like to catch stripers that are sitting still. I want my stripers moving fast. So it's like um, when you see those guys, uh, Jose Wahebe, the Spanish fly, when they're casting to redfish or tarpon and you're leading it, you got to get, you want to get out in front and you want to present it out in front of them as they're moving left or right. Um, Correct. How the hell, like, like, so those fish are moving so damn fast, though. Like, that's where I'm like, my mind's blown because those things are ripping like tuna. So is it you see them with your scope and then you're just trying to gauge the direction that they're going and then you're going to cast in front of them? Is that basically the game? It's it's all about angles and boat control. But absolutely, you're just trying to get that, that perfect money shot cast on them to present that thing naturally. And once they see it, it's just hang on. Uh, you know, you got to, sometimes you have to put different baits in front of them and figure out what they're, what they're like. And some days you'll go out there and they like a swim bait, a fluke style bait. Sometimes they want an A-rig. Sometimes they wanted the Mickey rig type bait. Um, it just, it all depends. Uh, I've caught them on jerk bait this year. Um, when I told you they ran up towards Buffalo and Bluestone, um, a buddy of mine, GW and I went down and I think we caught 40 to 50 that day. Uh, and we were catching them on flukes in the morning, a rays and even, but they were surfacing. Like you could literally see the flash of the fish coming up surfacing and we were burning a rays almost like a top water wow. <laughs> catching them that way. Yeah. That was a lot of fun. So, um, yeah, just rotating different baits. Um, and, you know, trying to keep up with those big schools. But again, every year they do a false run where there's a, there's a big group of stripers that run up towards Bluestone and the rivers, uh, my understanding, again, I'm no biologist. What I've read is there's something biologically telling them because the water temperature is changing to kind of make that false run. Again, please somebody correct me if that's you know if that's not accurate, but that's my understanding. But I can tell you, every year in November, from November and December, there is a mass migration of stripers from up the lake toward like North Bend, and Ivy Hill area. They come up the lake, and that's usually what I try to time it. Once you again, once you start seeing fish surface in the evening, the birds start to show up that's when I start to put the bass gear down and just chase stripers for the next four months. And, and that really gets into it with, uh, we got a good question here. Let me pull that back up on Instagram. Um, slain 63 on Instagram says, um, and you know, what tackle are you, what baits are you throwing, uh, this time of year for striper? Yeah. So, um, I'm throwing generally a rig. I throw that and I've got, you told me to bring a, bring a rod. Yes. So, yeah. And then, guys, ask a question, win a prize at Jake's Bait and Tackle. That's how easy it is. Ask a question, win a prize. So this is a Lou's Super Duty. It's a 7-Eleven. It's extra heavy, and I'm throwing that on a Lou's 300 series uh, reel. It's got the bigger spool. I'm throwing it on 25-pound Sunline, and I'm throwing an A-Rig uh, a lot of the times. 
Um, I mean, I don't think that the A rig really matters all that much. Um, well, like blades or no up, blades? Uh, I'll, I'll have generally I have three tied on. I have one with blades, one without blades, and then one that almost looks like a, a double A rig. Holy shit, uh, dude! <laughs> well, depending on again, depending on what kind of mood they're in. I've seen them. I've seen them bite a bladed A rig in the morning. They wouldn't touch it in the evening. They just wanted you know a, a blade less in the evening. They just switches up but you know, like the Demiki rigs and stuff like that i throw that's a, a shimano it's a shimano vanford um i think they're new i usually show it throw stratix but i really like phoenix um rods this is a mbx ultra um so these are a lot of fun they just you have to fight the fish uh for a really really long time um when you catch them on that light gear so you're going to go through less but it's a, it's a heck of a lot funner um everything else i'll throw like a you know uh let's see this is a phoenix um recon elite and i'll throw like i said big swim baits big fluke style baits on that and that's just a shimano dc karate reel i really like those reels i throw sh mainly shimanos and lose are the only kind of reels that i throw uh, and those are the rods are lose rods and Phoenix rods. I like, I've got some Dobbins rods that are good. Uh, and I've got a problem with rods. I'll get them just to try them out. And then they, I've got a bunch of them sitting out there. I need to have a yard sale one day, but I always end up with, I always end up back with Phoenix or lose every time. Dude, Phoenix. Thank you. I love Phoenix rods. Like I, I never find bump into people that like Phoenix too. I know. I, I didn't know how many people didn't like Phoenix rods until I started telling them about that. But I, I love their Feather series, their Recon Elite series. Uh, my, you know, my fishing par partner Austin, he really liked them. He was the one that turned me on to them. Um, and ever since I picked one up, man, the way it felt in my hand and how sensitive it was, I love them. Um, I have had some issues with the guides, but I'm I'm hard on stuff too, so that's more my fault than theirs. I have any warranty issue I've had, they they've taken care of it. I'd say their their warranty is not as good as Lou's, but it's still good. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll I'll promote the hell out of Phoenix too. The one thing I like about it is at the time when I went to Phoenix, there were not a lot of companies that had extra sensitive, like uh, extra fast tips that were like under a thousand dollars. Like you could get like high fancy flipping rods with that extra fast tip, but that was one of the few companies that you could find with it that was a decent price. Um, so yeah, really like that stuff. Oh my goodness, we got some questions here. So our first prize winner of the night, get the net. Uh, get the net. You just want a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. Message me on Instagram, Facebook, or you can email me fishingthedmv at gmail.com to claim your prize. Um, on the spinning rods, are you braid to fluorocarbon? And I'm going to add to his question, what size leader are you using for striper? Um, I am going 12-pound uh, braid, sunline, high-vis braid to 8-pound uh, sunline leader. Um, I think that's, um, some sniper leader or they also sell this, it's called leader, sunline leader. Um, but I run a really, really, really long leader. I'm talking eight foot, nine foot worth of Damn, leader. The reason, dude. Okay. the reason for that is I retie every time I, I catch, I, I've lost a lot of 30 plus inch stripers because I, I wasn't retying after every single catch and you catch one of the, the lighter stuff. Because I'm retying all day, I'm just going through that leader, and I, I tie an FG knot. And I, it, it's a pain in the ass to tie that thing on the water. I mean, it's a pain in the ass to tie any time, but it's really a pain in the ass when I mean, it's windy on the water. Um, so I run a really long leader so that I don't have to chew through that so fast. That's freaking awesome. And then we got another question here um, from Russ. Hey, Russ, you just want a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. You know the deal because you've won before. Instagram, Facebook, or email me to get your gift card. Um, are are uh, are they on the smaller or the larger bait right now for both, species both i caught i mean i i caught them on the whole full gamut today man again it's if anybody that's striper fishes different situations require different bait um i mean I, again i my preference is to catch them on an a rig or a 20 pound uh leader to like a big swim bait or something like that so i can horse them in um yeah i see you pull up the pictures those are the yeah. ones we caught today Oh, we got some today that were in the 28 inch range that were probably 10 pounds. I mean, they were some really big striper. Um, always curious because they they were built different than the ones that I was catching in Clarksville. I'm wondering are the ones in Clarksville, the natives, you know, descendants of the native fish that still do that false run. And some mm -hmm. of these I caught were farther up the lake, more mid lake section. I just was thinking to myself today, I wonder if these are the ones that don't really run up the lake or reproduce. They were hatched, but. 
Um, anyways, I forgot what the question was before I started rambling. No, no, no. That was that was that was awesome, man. You you nailed that question. And then the next one we got from Russ Russ again was uh, Dobbins uh, seven nine. 794.5 best a rig rod you'll ever use give it a shot brother like, how important is an a rig rod basically like a swim bait rod or is there a real distinct difference between a big swim bait rod and an a rig rod no i throw my big live baits i've got a, a, a big live bait that i've been catching some large mouth on the last uh the last few weeks and i throw that on my a rig rod so i'm sure that there's probably I'm sure there's somebody that thinks it's nuanced enough that you need one for each, but I reuse mine. And then uh, we got we got Miles Pog, uh, Miles Pog on Instagram, Streamyard. By the way, could you get it so I could share the comments on Instagram and the view count? It's really annoying that you don't do that, but we have about 15 people watching on Instagram right now. So the grand total is we got about 35 on a football Monday night, which I did not think about this morning. <laughs> When I decided to do this, that was a mistake. Um, anyway, Miles says like I run Phoenix. Uh, Phoenix are, are my go to as well. Like I'm glad all the Phoenix people are coming out of the closet now. This is good for us. Uh, we got we got Judah. Judah, uh, what uh, Judah? You just want a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle? Instagram message me, Facebook, or you can email me fishingdmvgmail.com to claim your gift card. What swim bait heads for the A rig been dealing with the hooks bending out? I have been dealing with the hooks bending out. I'm throwing them on uh, dirty jigs. It's the tactical bass and uh, swim bait heads. If you guys know what I'm talking about. I throw all eight ounce heads uh, every now and I do carry three sixteenths and a quarter and I'll weight a few of those down, but I always do like the bottom two to like act like a keel. If for the A rig that's coming through, you don't want to put it on the back weight or any of the top ones. It'll kind of make it want to do this in the water. Um, but I'll be honest with you, some of my hooks bend out as well. I mean, I just keep an eye on them. I'm really, really, if you've ever been, some of my friends will laugh. If you go fishing with me and I'm throwing an A-rig, I'm super, super anal about checking to make sure all the paddles are swimming, all the hooks are bent. Because I'm telling you, I can't tell you how many fish I've watched. And I'll tell my buddy, I said, that it's either fouled up or I've got a dead swim bait. And every single time it's either fouled up or got those fish know. So you have to make sure every fish catch all those paddles or those tails are moving because they'll track they'll track it and track and track it. And if you're wondering why they're doing it, I guarantee it's got something to do with that. Do you change the colors of your swim baits up? Are they all the same color and style, or do you do that weird trick where like one's a little different? I'm torn on this. I've, I've thrown all the same color a lot and had great success, but more often than not, when you go look at my boat, I'll have some white ones on the back. Uh, it's a white sight flash by Kai Tech. Uh, I had this year, I had been trying different heads. I've not found anything I like better than the dirty jigs. I went out online and just because the hooks were bending out sometimes, it, they seem to have changed their hook length. They used to sell some with a shorter shank. And I really like that. Now they've gotten long. Uh, and sometimes I'll throw a 2.8 on my A rig. Uh, I don't normally throw that size, but I like to go down, you know, if it's getting tough and you're seeing a lot of followers, you just got to try different stuff. Uh, but again, I haven't found anything that I like better than those. I mean, there, there you have it. Like, and that's the thing is too, like, I really hate it when they change their design because like when Bastrix changed their formula for like their sexy shad color, like it, there was a distinct change and it became a little bit more bluish or maybe it's just the packs of, of their, you know, sexy shad that I got were like that. Yeah. It, but you know, normally in uh, November, December time, they're, they are feeding so aggressively. I don't, I joked this year, I was like, there were so many fish in a Clark's for there. You could have thrown a naked hook out there and gone out there and caught you a limit in a day. Um, it's yeah. But as you transition now, when it starts getting colder, these fish get finicky. The fish in Clarksville got really educated really fast this year. I felt like, um, so you've got to try different things and, and you know, color starts to matter. Um, but then when they first come up there, man, you just go out there and swing on them with it. If you get, I like to throw a single bait, uh, a single hook bait because you can get them in, get them off, get back in the water. It's all about staying up with the schools or even as the birds are moving, it's all about that. So a rigs, if you guys know, if you, even if you boat flip, if you net one, you're going to be there for 10 minutes, getting the damn hooks out of it. Um, and even if you boat flip it, that can be a pain in the ass as well. Getting all the hooks out. Sometimes they'll get in your clothes as they're flopping around. Um, so single hook baits are best for speed and, you know, getting back in there real fast. And we got another question here from where, where did where to go? Oh, we got get the net again. Are you throwing the big hard swim baits or the soft? Uh, both. 
I'll have both titles. I just recently got some of the new Six Sense Hangovers. I don't know if you you've heard of those, Thomas, but uh, I got them. I like the weighted ones because I like the I want them to, for that tail to kick deeper. I like to read them over brush piles or uh, if I'm out chasing deep suspended fish over bait balls. Um, I like to like it to get down there pretty fast. Do you also like um, just having that belly hook? I for me. I think it looks, if you think of every fish I catch is looking up at that bait and the body is going to be between it and the hook. So for me, that's going to be more natural. Um, so I, that's why I like it. Not so much that I'm reeling it through cover or on cover or thing, things like that. I, you know, I heard Milliken say that's what, kind of why he put it on top because he likes to nick it. And that does work. I mean, I've, I've seen where you go through and pull it out of a brush pile and one comes up and, and grabs it, but that's not how I'm. I'm using, but I want to try those out. I like, love the the Mega Bass Mag Drafts. Um, I mean, they're a, they're a staple in everybody's that likes to say swim baits. I'm sure, um, but I like a lot of I like a lot of hard glide baits too. I like the a lot of the clutch uh, glide baits that they make. What depth are you fishing those glide baits at? I'm assuming it's relatively shallow, correct? Anywhere from two foot in the water while sitting over forty foot uh, up to. 15 foot. Damn. Wow. Yeah. Got- I, that, I, caught, I caught some two or three, some large mouth. That is, I don't throw. Now it's interesting. So let me finish my thought. A couple of weeks ago, I was catching them with a glide bait. And again, I'd be in 30 to 40 foot of water, but the fish were up in the top of the water column and they were coming up. I, it almost felt like you could catch them on a the top water is how skinny they were when you, they were getting hit in the glide. Like I was working it really fast, uh, going through the water. Um, but I went striper fishing the day after I went largemouth fishing and all this muddy water came into Clarksville, pushed all the bait, everything crappie, everything went way up in the top of the water column and the stripers were acting finicky. I started throwing a glide bait at the stripers because they were in that top five foot of the water column and bring it, but it won't fit in their mouth. They were rushing up at it, swatting at it, knocking it. They would knock slack in it. I felt like they were trying to eat it. They just, and that's the only time I've ever thrown a glide bait. The first time I ever tried it, I haven't tried it since. Um, but I felt like it wouldn't fit in their mouth good enough because I'm throwing a pretty big glide bait. I just wanted to see what they would do to it because everything else I had would fall too fast and get underneath them. I just happened to have that glide bait on the, on the deck. Um, so that was interesting. Damn, that's so interesting. Yeah, guys, I'm also proud of you. I know there's so much football going on, and there's a shit ton of people that care about striper fishing. Uh, we got Miles Pog on Instagram. Miles, uh, you just want a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. Um, reach out to me on Instagram, Facebook, email. Uh, have you ever thrown a blade bait for striper? I have. Yeah. Um, they, the, the blade baits I have, I probably could should upgrade the hardware, but they, they'll bend out the hooks real bad. Again, if I can catch a striper on a single hook bait, that's what I want to catch them on. Uh, anytime you start getting into treble hooks or, you know, multi, even a rig, sometimes they can be sketchy. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't do that much, but I have when it gets tough. Is it that bad? Like just using a treble hook bait? Like I mean, your 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 loss ratio? I, I think so. Uh, again, personally, they just pull off. Sometimes you get them on the side of the mouth if they're not getting it good. Um, and they'll, they'll pull off on you. And then we got we got one more on the, on the striper realm, guys. Get your striper questions in now. Uh, th- this guy's a beast. I watch all of his videos. His videos with with the music make you feel like you're in the boat, just rocking out. Keep up the great work. Awesome stuff. Love the vibes. Um, a question that I had for you that I bookmarked for myself was, what have you learned from striper fishing, doing the forward facing sonar, being out deep? Does any of those skills translate to largemouth? And what skills do translate to largemouth? Uh, skill wise, I mean, anytime you, I mean, look, ever, you know, there's this, there's this misunderstanding out there that you buy a live scope and you just throw to start catching fish, right? Everything is about spending time understanding what you're looking at. Uh, when you're using it, again, I'm not saying this is overly complicated, but boat control and angles is a really big deal. Making an accurate cast, you want that beam is very small, um, so trying to put a bait in the right place, and then it's really understanding how predators feed. I mean, um, you know, fish want to feed up, 
Um, so don't reel your bait underneath the fish. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's little stuff like that that you start to learn. Uh, I'd say more often than not, um, I spend a lot of time side scanning on the lake uh, for stripers because that's a lot of times if I don't see a lot of birds, I know that they relate to certain sections of certain creeks, certain points in certain creeks, just through my own personal uh, experience. Um, but I'll find a lot of new structure, a lot of new brush piles, a lot of house foundations, deep rock piles, things of that nature. And I'll circle back and fish those for bass all the time. So, you know, killing two birds with one stone on, on some of that stuff. Um, but really I'd say practicing with, you know, your forward facing sonar, practicing with your side scan and getting good with that and understanding what a striper is versus a car versus large mouth on side scan. You can tell the difference. Um, so th a lot of those things translate using your tool sets, uh, to catch a lot of fish. Um, I get a lot of that stuff does translate, but, um, they do behave differently. Uh, most, most of the year. I mean, there's certain times, like I said, where you're catching them together. There's a few times in Clarksville where they're, you know, just massive schools of striper schooling. I see largemouth cruising around on the bottom, caught a couple three pounders doing that, uh, this year. So cool. Um, so a lot of times they do mix together, but they, they're definitely different and they hold to different structure a lot of the times. Yeah. Judah's got another one here. Uh, is the big flush seven inch fluke by six cents a good striper bait? I wouldn't know. I've never fished that one. I'm going to assume a big ass fluke would work, but you're going to have to get it down or a scrounger head. Probably putting it on a heavy scrounger head would probably do the trick as well with that. Um, yeah. Fishing coach, uh, I hear some say that stripers have to keep moving or they deplete, they, they get depleted of oxygen. How much truth to that? And does it help when identifying with FS, FFS? Yeah. Yeah. They got to move. Yeah, that's my understanding as well. Again, no biologists, but that's what I've always read, and that's what I've always been told by other people who've been fishing for a long time. I also understand they, they can't reproduce naturally unless they lay their eggs and move in moving water. That's why there's that going up to Dan and the Stanton uh, every year when the, the some of the stripers still go up there naturally producing. You catch them in the March-April time frame. Um, it, as far as does that help you identify them for it? Hell no, because they won't stop moving. <laughs> 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 I mean, I'll tell you what, I mean, you're talking about draining some trolling motor batteries. My trolling motor stays on 10 from, again, November through February, and it's hard on them. Um, but that's what you that's what you got to do. Now, it's it's I think it makes it easier for you to locate those fish size scanning because they are always moving. But, you know, there was one there was one windy day two weeks ago, like really when like 15 mile an hour winds. Uh, and I side scanned for probably three and a half hours, couldn't find anything. And I was this one rocky bluff wall and I was in a, a creek mid lake and I had actually found some really, really large um, schools. Only one other person knew about it, Brett Lotta, if you're watching this. It's, it's a guy that I met through social media. Him and his son were out there and we were messaging back and forth. So he, I found the school in Rudd's called Brett and his son up there and we caught them and they were this huge schools, but it's like they all disappeared. I went and side scanned this bluff wall. It's about a 500 yard stretch. And it felt like every striper that I had found the days leading up to that were all congregated in this one big channel swing bluff wall. And they were sitting still when I found them. And I sat there for an hour trying to stay off the main pack, trying to pick one up off the back. Cause once you start dropping it right dead in the middle, it's going to break the school up and they're going to kind of disband. Um, and those fish weren't moving, which was weird. So that's, but I would say that's an anomaly. I haven't seen that much. Like I told you, if I see fish sitting still, I don't, I will literally sit there sometimes and watch the fish sitting still until they start moving. And then once they start moving, I'll make a cast. I don't want to cast at fish stripers that are sitting still. Does, are they affected by forward facing sonar like largemouth, smallmouth, and spot are? 100%. Really? I feel like I don't, I was telling somebody the other day when, the fish are swimming at you with the, with the live scope. I feel like they can feel it more. That's why I, I and again, it may be in my head. I want to, I prefer them swimming away from me if I can, but fish are getting conditioned to live scope 200%. Anybody mm -hmm. that says otherwise, and they're going to adapt and you're going to start catching less and less and less fish using live scope because of that. I mean, I've already seen that with large mouth on Kerr. Um, you know, there's certain little things you can do to try to overcome that, but, um, but yeah, they in a nutshell, they're all getting conditioned because I mean, it, it's so funny because like I've heard so many people like, well, I have a trick here. Yeah, but if like if three people do the trick and 6,000 don't do the trick, 
the fish are still conditioned to it because they're still getting the cancer I hit at them 24 seven. So sure. I, I don't know, like in theory, I've had Travis Luker on this show and he really thinks that in five or six years, there's just going to be a better bank fishing bite. Eventually like the fish will move off there or they shut down uh, completely. Who knows? <laughs> no, I agree. As more and more people go offshore and get better with it, I hundred percent do. They're always going to go where the pressure's not, or, you know, you start to find them on these no nothing these yeah. know nothing banks in this weird depth that most people don't even think to go fish. Um, if you can find like a, just a weird piece of structure on this know nothing flat, I'm starting to see a lot of fish. And again, the only way you're going to find it is just going out there and side scanning and you mark all this stuff in the winter time. And then you just go check it and you just keep checking it. And one day you show up and there'll be a pile of fish on it. Uh, and then just remember that for tournament day. You know, and, and that's a really, really great segue into, you know, the old, the old largy this time of year, um, with Kerr in, I know right now it's like blown out because apparently we're experiencing winter now for the first time with the snow and shit. Um, like do the largemouth and the striper, because a lot of largemouth in, in Kerr Bugs Island are very pelagic. They roam around a lot. Do they basically act the exact same way? And you're just looking for little differences and how they move, where they set up, or is it completely polar opposite? I wouldn't say they're polar opposite. I've got, I'd say some that you have out there following the the big balls of shad, uh, like the stripers are. I mean, again, I'm seeing a lot of that out there. I see a lot of crappy out there too. Um, I think you, you know, your bigger fish are going to be in that five to 15 foot range and on rock. If you can find 45 degree banks, I think that's good. Clay banks are good this time of year. Uh, anything channel swing. Um, but I, you know, because I because every winter I go chase stripers, I don't spend a lot of time. I fish, like I said, I fish some cur, uh, some cattail tournaments uh, in November. And again, once the striper bite showed up, I kind of I kind of ditched out. So um, if I were to go out there right now, I definitely would try to find some stuff on bait balls and the mouths of creeks or the mouths of pockets. Um, but I'm probably going to be running rock in that five to fifteen foot range and. Hoping for the best, throwing like a crankbait and a jig and a jerkbait is what I would go out there and chase largemouth with. So no A rig. A rigs too, yes, hundred percent. Okay. Um, yeah, it's it again. It depends on how much wind I've got. Um, everybody's throwing an A rig though now. I mean, they're the, the stripers are getting conditioned to it. I mean, I felt like the A rig bite died two weeks after they showed up <laughs> this year. You know, three, four years ago, you go out there, you may see one other boat throwing an A-rig. I, I I, would venture to find three or four boats that aren't throwing an A-rig now. So that's why I'm continuing to try different things and rotate different stuff. But they still, they'll still whack an A-rig, and there's some days that's all they want. It, it's um, You just got to keep them honest with that. There's so many baits like that nowadays where they yeah. had that, like a whopper plopper, I think is one of those baits where when it's that top water fall bite season, it's like, yeah, everyone has thrown it a thousand times, but you got to have one just in case that's for some reasons what they want that day. Um, and you guys are pouring in the large mouth question. Um, I, I'm going to start it off with, are, are you scoping these fish this time of year when you said rock? Like, so example is, are you hitting an area with the beam? Okay. This is a place I want to fish or it's more of just, I'm going to work the jig and then I'm going to move on. Uh, for me, they hug the bottom so much. I mean, you may see one and a lot of times you can actually see them. I call them snaking around on the bottom. Stripers will start to do this any week. Now they're going to start hitting the bottom and doing the same thing. A lot really? of them. Yeah. Large mouth will kind of keep their bellies. I mean, you, I've caught large mouth now where you look, look at their belly and it's got that red clay where they're actually sitting down in the, you know, sitting down in the mud and the dirt and stuff. So the live scope doesn't really help for those fish. And I think you're, the majority of your bigger fish that you'd catch, you catch, you probably wouldn't catch them on, out there live scoping out in the water column. I think they're going to be down on the bottom. That's interesting because I had a friend that came out. Um, <clears throat> he fishes a ton of largemouth tournaments and he had this one, I, this one way that he fishes with scope with largemouth. And it's usually cause they're up off the bottom, but we were fishing for smallies. And what I've noticed scope and smallmouth is those suckers will be on the bottom next to every damn rock or boulder and until you drop on them, you won't know that they're there. And they could be a three or four pound smallmouth. And, and it's crazy because they're camouflaged from scope. Like until they want to show themselves, you won't see them for shit. Yeah. A lot of largemouth are behaving that way right now in my experience out there. Is that because of the time of the year or do you think it's because of live scope or a little bit of both? I don't. 
Are they that smart? <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't think it's Lasco. When I first started using it, I got it in 2018, right when it first came out, and that was one of the first things. I mean, they were on the bottom. I don't think anything's changed because of the evolution of more people getting it. Again, I have a small data set that I'm giving you an, an opinion on, right? Yeah. Uh, but I, I don't think it's got anything to do. I just think that they want to be down there on the rocks. Um, I think. They heat up. I think it gives them structure, and I, for whatever reason, I like to relate to that. Now, I'm sure you can still catch them on brush and wood and things of that nature. Just for me, winter and rock just seems to go together. Dude, that's freaking awesome. And then, guys, if you want to get your questions into a a, um, a a local Kerr fisherman, please ask them away. Again, this is Monday Night Live every Monday at 7 p.m. We got another uh, we got another great question from Get the Net. Get the Net, man, you have been asking some fantastic questions. Do you use a Demiki rig? If so, what bait has been your best for largemouth? That, that's been uh, like the Alabama rig nowadays, too. Everyone's throwing a Demiki yeah. rig. Yeah, yeah, man, it's it's just a, a fluke style bait. It's it's you know it's nothing specific about it. I throw just a plain old white. I don't get into colors now. If the water's like super, super clear, I try to throw something that's transparent. Um, I usually throw them on quarter ounce, uh, little quarter ounce jig kids. Um, but yeah, and it, I say a fluke, and then sometimes I throw like an easy shiner, a Kitech easy shiner, like a three inch, uh, a single swim bait, three and a half inch single swim bait. Um, you know, they'll catch largemouth. You know, I, I really like a jerk bait this time of year. If I can go out there, if it's enough wind and they're in a, a glide bait kind of mood, I like that's always something you should check. Uh, I'm not the best glide bait fisherman. I don't like treble hook baits, like I told you. Um, you end up getting your heart broke more often than not um, with those. Um, but yeah, the those little, just a small profile, uh, finesse little swim bait, you, you can't go wrong with that stuff. They're just it's so versatile. And it'll catch everything. It'll catch white bass. It'll catch stripers. It'll catch crappy, catch largemouth. I mean, this time of year, you, you got to have some of those on your boat. What do you pair that with? Are you throwing it out on 15 pound test, 12 pound test, spinning rod outfit? Uh, yeah, that's that one I showed you. This uh, same this setup. 12. Yeah, same exact setup. 12 pound uh, Sunline, uh, the high vis to eight pound liter. And it's a medium light rod. And again, this is the new. Vanford from Shimano. I, it's the first time I fished with it. Today. I liked it. I'm still a Strat guy. That's what I had the most of. Um, I figure I'd try that out since everybody's seen how good it was. Dude, I mean, you can go down a rabbit hole tackle so freaking easily. Uh, Patrick, you just want a gift card to Jake's bait and tackle. Congratulations. Reach out to me on Instagram, Facebook, or you can email me at fishingdmv.com to get your prize. Do you turn the, transduc the transducer away from them or shut it down? Will is a hammer on Kerr. You guys like to say Kerr or Car because I've been yelled at both ways. <laughs> I'll, I'll call it Bugs or Kerr. I say Kerr. I always call it Kerr. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right either. Uh, and I, I appreciate the vote of confidence. I'm just a weekend warrior brother and try to be a student of sport. I'm starting to know hammer. I can give you a list of name of hammers on bugs though. <laughs> <laughs> there's a few. Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a whole bunch. I can, I know a lot of them, but I'm certainly not one of them. Uh, but I, do I turn it away? No, I, I often find myself turning off 2d, believe it or not. Hmm. Um, especially if I'm going to, let's say a size scan and I'm, I'm size scanning for stripers and I, I don't do that, but if I'm going to go down a bank, just live scope and say in 10 or 15, trying to look for structure and look for fish, I'll cut my 2D off and just have the live on. Um, but no, I don't, I don't, you know, do I turn it away sometimes, but you know, I, I want to see them eat. I want to see how they're reacting to it too. Cause either they're going to eat or I'm going to learn a lesson that I can apply for the next fish that I see over there. So I kind of want to see what the fish's behavior is on the bait that I'm throwing at it. I, I, I do believe that there is a time and place to turn the transducer away, but I've only had it for about 365 days and I'm not experienced enough to know when that moment is when you should turn it away. Um, yeah, I just know too many good, good fishermen that do have that in their rotation of they, they know gut instinct. Well, okay. I should just pull this beam away because of how he's responding to it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think there are those out there that do it. I, I wouldn't say that's a, a common practice for me. That's probably maybe why I'm not winning on Kerr all the time either. <laughs> Kerr's a hard place to fish, man. It really is. And I think yeah. it's it's not just, I think it's because of the population. And I, I know I've gotten yelled at by this from people that are, that enjoy Kerr. 
I just think if the population was a lot bigger, like you have on like Lake Champlain or the Potomac River, I just feel like it'd be a lot easier to win. When it's when the population is smaller, if you have a lot more good spots, the juice, you know, you have a higher advantage than when you have a better population because then the best, the biggest fish can't just set up on the three stumps. They have to find other places to like to set up. That's my hypothesis anyway. Yeah. Because those six pound unicorns, those four pound unicorns at Kerr are just so important to every bag I've oh, had yeah, on the dude. show. Yeah, if you're gonna if you're gonna win down there, you damn sure better catch at a minimum uh, one, if not multiple. Um, and it, it, you know, sometimes it feels like a three is a daggone unicorn down there. That again, I think I think everything's getting better down there. Personally, um, slowly, yeah, slowly, yeah, it, it is slow. I think you said it the last time we talked. Yeah, but when you're starting from a negative five, <laughs> <laughs> right? So, you know, I'm getting excited going out there catching, you know, every trip catching threes and then, you know, more often than not catching a four and even having a lot of luck this past year catching some fives, a few fives. Um, but then, you know, I go to other public lakes and, you know, you're catching 25 pounds of largemouth and you're like, God, I wish I could go to Kerr and do this. Yeah, but so it's, you're practicing on a lake that gets a lot of tournaments. I mean, one lake that notoriously catches big weights would be like Smith or Lake Anna. Lake Anna last year, they caught some dirty thirties, but the problem is there's no big tournaments there 24 seven, like Kerr. Kerr yeah. has a lot of tournaments. So you, you gotta, you gotta get good at that place. If you want to be bass fishing in this area of the country. And one interesting thing that came from practicing is I had, I had somebody on the show last that talked about one thing that helped them is they went down there when the lake gets dropped to its absolute lowest point. And you drive around, you take pictures, you just you just you just puddle around. How important is that in 2024 when we have people with 10 units, you know, GPS on everything? Like, does that still help just to drive around when the lake is low? 200 percent man. And if you if you're and that's where I told you I first started going down there around 2015, just beating my head against the wall. But one of the things I did was I remember breaking ice to get my damn boat out of the boat ramp to get out there and never even picked up a rod. I literally went around size canning and looking at the bank marking stuff. And I always remembered, I wish Lawrence or one of the, the will come out with a product where you could take a picture and maybe they have this and I just don't know about it, by the way, if you do, let me know. But you could take a picture of the bank date and time stamp it and then upload it to the waypoint that you just added. Because a lot of times oh, I'm marking rock, rock piles and I want to know what the, specifically what this rock pile looks like after the water is 10 foot you know, high in the spring. I always thought that would be a really cool feature. But I've done that where I've taken pictures with my phones of rock piles and things like that and then come back to it, fished it and pulled it back up. 100% that helps. And a lot of the guys, that if you go down there and you talk to, you know, I, I think – some of the the big name guys that win all the time, I know they do that. They've told me they do that. Um, where they're riding around in the wintertime um, and looking at the banks. And because it could be subtle stuff, right? A lot of times they'll just set up on this chunk rock bank going into this cut. So it's a bunch of no nothing banks, but this one little roundy point has all this chunk rock. And in the spring, you go down and you think nothing of that. And you come through there in the spring with a crankbait and it's every single cast because they're up there eating those crayfish out of that chunk rock. And you can size scan that stuff, but even with, I know Hummingbird, I think, does the best job size scanning. I think Lawrence does a really good job with their new 3 in 1 transducer. I think it's just as good or very close. But even when I'm trying to scan at that level, which would have been like four to five foot up there on the bank, I don't think I'm going to pick the detail up that I saw when that lake was 10 foot low and you're riding around in the wintertime. Again, how, just much of these. How do you drop a waypoint on something that's high and dry? And make sure it's it's accurate for three months later. Get really close. <laughs> That's what I do. <laughs> Trim up and get really damn close. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, I know how to do it, you know, and zoom, I zoom, you know, way in on my boat on the, the Lawrence. And then I just try to guesstimate. Uh, gotcha. But then, then, then you go back in the spring with a crankbait and you feel right. Yeah, it's, you, you can go through there and feel it. Um, and you'll know where you're at. I and mean, that makes sense like for the chunk rock, because I guess if it's a stump or a tree, that's something that will pop up on, on mega 360 or your side scan. So you'll be able to find that thing again when it's in the water. Correct. It's the subtle shit that it really pays dividends for. Correct. And again, the more and more, the, you know, people are getting better at understanding where the obvious places to check for fish are. It's a lot of these weird, no nothing places. And the thing is, you just got to put time in to go check this stuff all the freaking time. 
And one week it may not be loaded up, and the next week it will. And then you start to put a little pattern together. All right, they're in this depth with this type of rock. And you start going checking all the other stuff that you know. But a whole lot of that is marking really, you know, stuff that's not obvious and then spending the time out there to go check it. You hear, uh, again, this, with the, go ahead, you hear this with the pros. How do you manage your waypoints? Because I'm assuming if you if you won in the lottery and could just fish all the time, you could spend a month easily just waypointing that lake when it's down. So how do you manage your weight? Do you delete waypoints? Do you save them off on an SD card? Like how do you organize it? I save them on an SD card, but just to back them up. I mean, my system is stumps, you know, BRP, big rock pile, BR, uh, B, big brush pile, BRP, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, it, there's nothing sophisticated. I probably use three or four different icons. Um, you know, if I'm marking big schools of fish that are, um, migratory, I use a certain icon for that. And I'll go back if, as I'm going down like Sask and I go through and delete wherever I found it to free up space. Um, the, the biggest help for me is using Google Earth on the desktop. I think mm -hmm. if you go back to 2009 or 2011, Kerr was really down. And I went through and just spent hours just following the shoreline and clicking waypoints. And I upload those from my computer to my Lorantz because it's just latitude and longitude. And then I go check it. Right. And then you start to eliminate. So you can actually if you can find the year where any lake, uh, not just Kerr, any lake that's gone down and follow that shoreline, um, you can actually start breaking lakes down from your recliner or watching some football on a Monday night. That's freaking cool. Uh, what level? If you wanted to go out there and, and for people that aren't in the area that are for some reason say, oh, I want to go down there. First off, don't go right now because it's like flooded. But like what level yeah. are you looking for? Like this is a good time to go. That the Army Corps uh, two nine. So it depends. This time of year, I wanted like 298, 299. Spring, I wanted the bushes, man. I wanted to oh, flip yeah. bushes and flip bushes and flip bushes and flip bushes. Um, live scope is fun and all, but man, I'd much rather just go leaning on them with a big, heavy flipping stick. That's, that's fun to me. Um, so I wanted 304, 303 in the bushes, and then 298, 299 this time of year. So I think that's a good level, but you know, the lower it gets, they just set up in the same area, just a little bit further out on the structure. So springtime, you want 304 in the wintertime. If you're trying to trying to fish and catch them, you want 298. And then if you want to just research the lake, you want to like what? 260, 240, like, like, Oh no, it doesn't get down to, uh, uh, geez, the low two nineties. I think the lowest I've ever seen it was the high two eighties. Wow. Uh, okay. Yeah, and that was that. That was a long, long. I mean, I'd say a long time ago. Geez, that was probably four, five years ago that it was that low. Uh, maybe even longer. Maybe it's seven or eight years since, I, since I've seen it that low. Uh, but not two ninety five, two ninety six. Because I mean, normally in the spring it's going to run three hundred one to three hundred three. Um, so you don't need it super, super low. And again, where that's really benefiting you, in my opinion, is in the spring and right after they're done with the spawn and you know pre spawn, spawn and post spawn is when all that that bank structure and that subtle stuff is going to be that you want to pay attention to. And that gets into, uh, and then guys get your questions in now. Cause we're not going to be going way, way too long since I have to start packing stuff up for Richmond. Uh, get the net, get the net. Um, the fish on Kerr go for a ton of boat rides, bass boat, Uber in the spring moves a ton of fish. Do you feel like there is always an offshore bite? Uh, I would say I know guys who could always go catch them offshore. I would say I'm not that guy. I know, and, you know, say the last part of March through the first part of April, I've gone out there offshore and it, it's like a barren wasteland. Everything's up in 10 foot or less. Um, but again, there's there's guys down there have holes that feels like it holds fish all year round that's offshore. So, yes, for some, I'd say for most, um, no. Get the net. I want to rephrase your question a little bit because I, I had a friend that said, like, there's you there's always a bite up shallow, but it doesn't mean you can win up shallow. I'll flip it around. I think there's always a bite deep, but it doesn't mean it's a winning fish. And so I, I, I'm going to rephrase the question a little bit there. It's like in the spring, is there winning bites or winning bags out there? You could probably catch five, but is it even worth bringing those in in the spring? I personally don't think so. No. Okay. I think you, I mean, you see it all the time where people are coming and bringing stuff in on a jig and a spinner bait and a crankbait, man. I mean, it's, you know, we can make it as complex as it, we want it to be. It's just about covering water and getting in that right area and, you know, throwing basic baits, in my opinion. It's just how well you know the lake and 
how much time, energy, and effort you're putting in down there leading up to that tournament. I really think that's also to to just kind of like put more on your point with the popularity now in the mag draft and the glide bait. It, I know a lot of guys at Fish Smith, and they're so good offshore. But then they just get frustrated when you have this Uber that comes down during a spring tournament and they just hit docks with a mag draft and they win. And, and it's yeah. so it's so crazy, but there's been leverage for shallow anglers. If it's that time of year, it's the new jig. Back in the day, like when I fished high school, they're like, you always got to lock a jig in your hand and get the five bites. That's what the glide bait and the mag draft is. And you'll have a dude that will just show up at Kerr, I think, too. They'll get five. I think that, and they'll just show with a spinner bait and just kick your butt. Yeah, I mean, there's, I've, I've seen guys that, man, you you don't even want to fish against them in April and May because they're just that damn good. Or, you know, maybe end of March to the very first part, that six-week stretch, they hard to beat them anywhere on that damn lake, and they're just throwing a spinner bait. Um, I mean, spinner bait is hard to beat on that lake. I caught a lot of nice fish down there off of spinner bait. Um, but I, I hear what you're saying. I'd say the – the guys that win consistently on Kerr would share that opinion that they probably hate the springtime as well uh, because any other time of the year, they're going to consistently show up and probably dominate and beat 98% of that field. But it is a, it's anybody's game come April, March, April, and the beginning of May. It really is. I think that's why you get pros like the John Cox is the world that they're so deadly because they're so good at that time of year and it's applicable on like every damn lake in the country that 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 pre spawn to spawn thing. It's it's basically the same and it's not it's not a hard learning curve. I do think in the summer, the fall, the winter, you have an inside edge if you know the lake. But the springtime, like you said, you can be dumped anywhere and you you have a, a puncher's chance. Um, yes. I mean. It's such an interesting lake, and the spinnerbait thing just just really makes me throw it back. Like I do not remember the last time Bassmaster had a tournament that was won on a spinnerbait. It's been a couple of years, I think. Uh, there was a guy that did well at Kentucky Lake Levy. What the hell was his name? It, it, it escapes me. But yeah, the spinnerbait's just fallen out. Do you think that's why it's doing so good now? Is people forgot about it for a while, and it's coming okay. back? I think so. I mean, I think a spinnerbait, from what I've been told for the guys that have been fishing that lake longer than I have, it's always done good. I mean, the lake's got a tremendous amount of bait fish. It's just a mini Alabama rig, depending on how many blades you're using. Uh, it's a single hook mini Alabama rig, and it's it's powerful bait. Draws them away. You can switch your blades out to make it thump different, um, make it, you know, go through higher or lower. So um, I, I don't think it's because less piece of people are throwing it because – if you go out there in the spring, man, every boat you're going to pass will be slinging a spinnerbait on Box Island. Um, but some of those other baits that you called out to, you know, your mag drafts, your your glides, they work as well. Um, again, it's got to be the right conditions and the right setup uh, or the right area. Um, but it's hard to beat a crankbait, a jig, and a spinnerbait in the spring, I think, on, on Kerr. All right, guys, we got one more question because we're gonna we're not going to be going for six hours tonight. Uh Darren seven three eight whatever that's a weird name. Um, when do you know to make the transition to from a crankbait to a spinnerbait? Are you both throwing them at the same time? Uh, crankbait for me. Once the water temps get in the sixties, I'll start throwing a spinnerbait. I like to throw crankbaits in the low fifties, right up to sixty. I'll still throw a crankbait uh, when it gets, but it starts to get over sixty five. I'll maybe keep a square bill on the deck just to keep it honest. And you'll if you go down a bank, good rocky bank, and it looks right, pick it up and start slinging a little bit. But generally 50 to 60, I like that crankbait bite. And then 60 to 75, spinnerbait. There you go, guys. There you have it. And then the last two things, we got uh, Russ Hamilton with Ryan. Um, I'm not going to try that. Paroskin, Paroskin, I guess. And then uh, Aaron Martins. Yeah, he won with the – now, he won with a spinnerbait, but also a chatterbait. I know he's throwing a chatterbait. I watched him. I actually drove my boat down there and actually watched him day two, I think. Um, I know he had a spinnerbait in the rotation, Ross. I, I also know he had a chatterbait. I think he caught the big seven-pounder on a chatterbait, if I'm not mistaken. Could be wrong. Let me know in the comment section. But, um, Will, if people want to follow you on your, on your exploits, um, follow you, get more tip, whatever, what, what, what can they do? Where can they follow you? Yeah, but you can shoot me a friend request on Facebook. Again, I, I do make YouTube videos. I don't, I'm not a videographer. I'm not like a, you know, some of your more famous YouTubers. I, the reason I personally do it is when I'm an old man, as long as YouTube maintains its infrastructure, I can go back and watch the videos. 
Um, so for me, it's kind of like, and it'd be cool to think my great grandkids could watch a video again, as long as YouTube stays up. So those are the reasons I do it. I heard somebody comment on the music. Usually whatever music I'm playing on my videos, I have a little bit where I do the first ride out on tournament day when I'm closing the credits out. That's usually a song that I'm listening to or the style of music I'm listening to at the time. So it's a very basic, very elementary format, but it just look up Will Nash on YouTube. Uh, and if you guys like to watch a guy's got a passion for fishing, that's all. It's just showing my fist catches from cast to catch. Again, hopefully one day I can relive those if I'm fortunate enough to be old enough to live in a nursing home. Um, I can sit there and watch those. So that's the reason I do it. But check me out on uh, Will Nash on YouTube or just um, um, check me out on Facebook. Search for Will Nash. We got, oh, and Judah just wanted to know, what's, what's the name of your YouTube channel? Just to confirm that, it's called Will right. Nash? Yep, just look up Will Nash. Just okay. my first and last name again. I, I didn't get fancy with, uh, you know, Will Nash is awesome bass fishing, none of that stuff. Just Will Nash, if you want to go watch me. Uh, I, I, like I said, I fish local tournaments. I fish some cat trails this year. I fish some Carlite Bass Masters and then a small TNT Outfitters. But mainly I'm just taking a camera along and trying to catch fish and have a good time doing it. And I like to share with other people. And I really like it when people share their fishing adventures that I can watch. So trying to give back on the content front a little bit. That dude, you've been doing a great job. And then as always, guys, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about. Um, again, this is how this works for these Modern Night Lives. I know people were like really confused about this last time, even though I've been doing this for about nine months now. This thing is going to go private so I can polish up audio, get all that uh, figured out. And then it's basically being re-uploaded tomorrow morning to Apple, Spotify, iHeart, and YouTube. Uh, link in the episode description to Will's social media handles, his YouTube, the whole shebang. And then uh, we got a couple more episodes dropping this week. And then we have Richmond Fishing Expo. We're going to be hauling ass to that. We're going to be giving you content 24-7. I will not sleep. We'll see you guys next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing in DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.